Hey guys, it's Yaron and today we're going to solve another coding interview question. The question I chose for today is find the duplicate number. It is lit code 287, which is labeled as a medium difficulty. And I'm going to give you a bit of a spoiler here. The optimal solution will be Floyd's algorithm for cycle detection, but I don't want to just show you the solution like it came from nowhere. I want to show you the entire thought process leading up to it. And because I didn't want this video to be too long, I decided to split it into two parts. In this part, I'm going to explain how to even get to the point where you know that you have to use Floyd's algorithm to solve this. So we're going to do all the incremental optimization steps leading up to the optimal solution. And then in the next video, I'm going to explain Floyd's algorithm in detail. I'm going to explain why it works, how it works, the whole thing. So let's get straight into it. So the description goes like this. Given an array of integers nums containing n plus one integers, where each integer is in the range one to n, inclusive, there is only one repeated number in nums. Return this repeated number. You must solve this question without modifying the array nums and use only constant extra space. So let's look at the examples to make sure we fully understand the question. In this example, we get this array of five elements and the output for this array should be two because that is the number that appears more than once. In this example, the output should be three because uh, three appears more than once in the array. Uh, and by the way, it is possible for the repeated number to appear more than twice. Uh, I mean, this is also a valid input uh, and the output in this case should also be three. Okay, let's start to think of the solution. And I wanna start by completely ignoring uh, these constraints, right? Um, so if I could use some extra space, what would I do? So the simplest way to solve this with some extra space is to keep a hash set that will keep track of the scene elements, right? So in C++, this would be an unordered set. It will contain integers and I'm going to call it scene. Now for each element in the array, we're going to check, have we seen this number before? Do we have it in our set? So if our set contains num, if it's in our set, we know we've seen it before, so it must be the duplicate, so we return it. Otherwise, uh, we insert it into our set because now we have seen it. And I'm also going to add a return minus one here, even though we're never going to reach it because we're guaranteed to have a repeated number in the array, but I'm going to add it just for uh, completeness. And this should work. Let's try. Okay, good. So the space complexity for this solution will be O of N and the time complexity will be average O of n. Now, a nice small optimization that we can do here, and this is a really important technique because it comes up in a lot of different questions, uh, would be to use an array instead of a hash set. This will improve the time complexity from average O of n to worst case O of n. So because we know that all the numbers are in the range one to n, we can easily just keep an array of booleans of size n to keep track of the scene elements. So it will just replace this set with an array with a vector in C++ and it will be the size, the same size as the input array, initialized to false. And then to check if we've seen an element before, we just check the relevant position in the array. If this is true, then we know that we have found a duplicate, so we return the uh, number. Otherwise, we want to mark the relevant position in the array as seen. And this should work. Let's try to submit this. Okay, that is a really good improvement already. Now, what can we do next? We want to completely get rid of the extra space, right? That was one of the constraints in the question. Uh, so we want to get rid of this scene array. So what we can do is try to mark the input array for scene elements instead of using an extra array. Now notice that if we're going to mark the input array, it means that we'll be modifying the input, which is not allowed. Uh, but I'm going to continue to ignore this for now because these are all incremental optimization steps that will get us to the optimal solution. So because we know that all our numbers are in the range one to n, we know that they are all positive. So one way to mark the number as being seen uh, is to just negate it, right? So what we could do is just, first of all, let's take out the scene array. And what we can do to mark scene elements is to just negate it like this. And now this check becomes, if the relevant position is negative, then we know that we have seen this number before, so we return it. And now because there is a chance that this value is now a negative value, we wanna take the absolute uh, value of this, right? because otherwise this would go out of range. So we take the absolute value and this should work. Okay, good. So uh, this solution will have a time complexity of O of N and a space complexity that is constant. 
So the one last constraint that we have to uh, meet here is to not modify the input array. So in order to do that, let's try to see what this code is doing step by step with an example. So we have this input array nums. In our solution, we start by looking at the first position. So we look at the first position. The absolute value in the first position is one. So we go to position one and check if it contains a negative value. It does not contain a negative value, so we negate it and move on to the next iteration. We look at position one. The absolute value in position one is three. Uh, so we go to position three and check if it contains a negative value. It does not, so we negate it and move on to the next iteration. We look at position two. The absolute value in position two is four. So we go to position four and check if it contains a negative value. It does not, so we negate it and move on to the next iteration. We look at position three. The absolute value in position three is two. So we go to position two. We check if it contains a negative value. It does not, so we negate it and move to the next iteration. We look at position four. The absolute value in position four is two. So we go to position two and check if it contains a negative value. And this time it does contain a negative value. And what that means is that we have seen this number before. We know that we have found a duplicate, so we return it. Now what I'm seeing straight away is that we've created a linked list, right? And then there is a cycle here that starts at position two, which just happens to be the duplicate number that we're trying to find. And I can tell you that cycles almost always mean something. So what I would do at this point is do another example and see if this is a recurring pattern. So let's get rid of this code here. We don't need it for this. So in this example, we again start at position zero. That is the head of the list. And uh, we treat the value in the cells as if they were pointers to the next cell in the list. So according to that logic, cell zero points at cell three. Cell three points at cell four. Cell four points at cell two cell two points at cell three. And again, we see here that there is a cycle and it starts at position three, which is the duplicate number that we're looking for. So at this point, I suspect that the list will always have a cycle and that the duplicate number will always be the entry point to that cycle. But simply suspecting is not enough. What we need to do next is convince ourselves that that is really the case. Let's start with the first question. Will the linked list always have a cycle? So let's think of it this way. If the array size is four, then we have four cells one for every index. And all the values are in the range one to three. Cell zero is the head and cell zero cannot point to itself because zero is not in the range one to three, right? Uh, so it has to point to one of these three cells. Let's say it points to cell one. Cell one also has to point to one of these cells. It cannot point here because zero is not in the range one to three and it cannot point anywhere else because these cells are the only ones in the range one to three, right? Now, if it points to itself, then we get a self loop, which is also a cycle and we're done, right? We have our cycle, but let's say it points to cell two. Cell two also has to point to one of these cells. If it points to itself, then we get a cycle here and we're done. If it points to cell one, we also get a cycle and we're done. So let's say it points to cell three. Now again, cell three has to point to one of these cells because they're the only ones in the range one to three and no matter where it points, a cycle is created, right? Uh, if it points to itself, then we get this loop. If it points to cell one, we get this cycle. And if it points to cell two, we get this cycle. And see, this has to happen because none of the cell can point outside of these uh, three cells. And in the general case, where we have uh, the array size of n plus one, all the cells will have to point to one of these n cells. Right? There, there are no null pointers, so there is no way to exit. That means the linked list will always have a cycle and the head cell zero will never be inside the cycle because no one can point to it. The next question I wanna answer is, will the duplicate number always be the entry point to the cycle? So let's look at our example again. Notice that the number of incoming edges a cell has is equal to the number of times the index appears in the array because that's the way we define the list, right? The reason cell two has two incoming edges is because two appears here and creates this edge. And it also appears here and creates this edge. We also know that there is only one duplicate or repeated number in the array, right? If I move this part here for a second, we will see that it says that in the description. All the other numbers will appear at most once, which means they will have at most one incoming edge. So that means that the duplicate number will be the only cell that has more than one incoming edge. Now, because we know that there is exactly one cell that has more than one incoming edge, 
we know that it has to be the start of the cycle. Because in order to be the start of the cycle, a cell would have to have one incoming edge that comes from the part before the cycle, you know, this part here. Uh, and we know that this part exists because zero cannot be in the cycle, right? Uh, so it has to be in the part before the cycle. And it will also have to have a second incoming edge that closes the cycle. Uh, so it needs to have at least two incoming edges and the only number that can have two incoming edges is the duplicate. So the repeated number in the array will for sure be the entry point to the cycle. And now the problem becomes find the entry point to a cycle in a linked list. And this problem can be solved with Floyd's algorithm for cycle detection, also known as the tortoise and the hare. And just as a side note here, if you've never seen this algorithm before, I highly doubt that anyone can just come up with it during an interview, uh, like on the fly. Uh, but I will explain the intuition and why it works and how it works step by step. So from now on, you will have it in your toolbox. Because I decided to split this video into two parts, we're going to do all that in the next video. So thank you for watching. I will see you in the next one.